today we're talking about Waste Management 2.0. Uh, my name is Heather Repenning and I'm the Vice President for the Board of Public Works. Um, and I uh, am our board liaisons to um, LA Sanitation. So I work uh, uh, very closely with um, our sanitation agency at the city of LA. Um, and, you know, uh, talked with the organizers here uh, at uh, the Verde Exchange about doing a panel to highlight um, kind of the future of, uh, of how we're handling waste. Um, I really wanted to talk about food and organic waste, and I really wanted to talk about um, the energy nexus in relation to waste management as well. So we're going to be touching on uh, those topics today. Um, I am very pleased to be joined by some uh, great people. Um, I'll start with Claire Fox on my left. Um, she's the executive director of the LA Food Policy Council. Um, and in this role, she collaborates with a large network of public, private, nonprofit, and community leaders to catalyze policy and systems change for a sustainable and fair food system. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Claire on a number of projects, including um, accepting uh, EBT or food stamps at farmers markets, um, including uh, she's very active in our food waste task force, um, and she is just a great person working uh, with us in, in LA. Um, we're also joined by, uh, by Paul Rellis. Um, he is the senior uh, vice president of CRNR Incorporated. Um, they are the developer and operator of one of the world's largest anaerobic digesters, uh, digester to renewable gas projects in the world. It's located in the city of Paris in Riverside County. Um, we're gonna be hearing from him uh, on that project and generally uh, on the topic of, of waste, renewable energy. Um, and we are also joined by Mark Nidum, uh, all the way from New York. Um, he's president and CEO of Green Conversion Systems and an operating partner at Wave Capital. Green Conversion Systems is introducing a waste 2.0 technology into the California market that results in 90 to 95 percent waste diversion from landfills and produces a fuel that replaces coal. Um, so really some uh, interesting things going on and I was, it was suggested to me that I uh, take the opportunity to start um, by talking a little bit about what we're doing in the city of LA. Um, and, uh, you know, we are in LA in the midst of, ta of taking the next big step in our plan to get to, to zero waste by 2025. Um, and so we're, we're basically rolling out a, a recycling program. It's called Recycla. You might have read about it in the paper. Um, it's been pretty much universally panned uh, by people who follow such things. But um, I'm here to tell you that, you know, I really believe in, in what we're doing. And, you know, we've, there are some things that, uh, that are, are problems w with the program. But basically, you know, what we're doing is we're regulating um, an industry that, you know, pretty much uh, was governed by um, practices that were uh, completely unsustainable, including um, there are basically 70,000 accounts who are part of this program. Um, and those are commercial properties and apartment buildings over four units. Um, the city obviously collects um, single family uh, homes and um, small apartment buildings. So there's 70,000 accounts that were um, previously served by a, a totally unregulated um, free market. And so what happened, what was happening uh, is that re recycling was just not happening. Um, people weren't willing to pay for it and the accounts that were willing to pay for it were scattered around, so it wasn't, the haulers didn't necessarily want to, to provide it. Um, so our program that we're in the middle of, um, of implementing, it requires recycling. And it actually motivates customers to recycle because the service to your blue bin is free. Um, so the service to your black bin you get charged for. So the idea is that through this program we are going to educate um, all of these buildings to start recycling and as they begin to recycle more and more, they can actually reduce their black bin service and save money. Um, we've had some challenges. Uh, the first, cha the primary challenge has been uh, service. Um, so you imagine uh, the enormous transition. Um, we think about 50,000 of these accounts have changed hands from one company to another. So you imagine all these new drivers servicing new buildings, um, the keys and all the things required to, to get service right. 
Um, and so we have had some challenges and, and probably more than we anticipated. Um, but I also feel like given the scope and scale of what we're trying to do, um, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. And obviously I say that I, I, I very much, uh, we're, we're very much um, sympathetic to all of the, the customers who have, who have had to be inconvenienced by the changeover. Um, but people's bills are also higher. And, you know, what we're finding is that really the system that we have previously, people were paying, you know, really just, I mean, the, co the companies were undercutting each other uh, and, um, and so people's prices have increased. Um, we're getting a lot though from the program. Um, besides just recycling, we're getting clean fuel vehicles. Um, the air quality uh, enhancements are going to be, you know, because we have a lot fewer trucks on the road um, because you have now one company servicing each neighborhood um, and they're all clean air vehicles. Um, the infrastructure is going to be cleaner, the bins are going to be cleaner, um, they're going to be building uh, more MRFs in the city, adding more jobs. Um, the jobs that are part of the program are now um, paid a living wage. Um, our fa the facilities that are part of the program are going to be certified and they're going to be safe, as you know, workers in this sector. Maybe you don't know, but I assume you're all waste heads if you're here. Um, the, wor the, work the workplace in this sector hasn't always been safe. So there are a lot of benefits to the program. Um, you know, people talk about the Paris, you know, agreement around climate and the work of converting systems in order to mitigate against climate change. And that, what we're doing is, that is this work. It's adaptation, it's, ad it's adapting uh, the, way that we, the way that we do things to help address um, the fact that our planet is, he is heating up. Landfills are huge emitters of greenhouse gases and we have to, for a bunch of different reasons, um, reduce our reliance on them. Um, food waste and organic waste, uh, huge uh, uh, emitter uh, in landfills of GHGs. Um, I, uh, right before I came into here, I was at the, this water charrette and um, David Nahai, who is, um, uh, uh, used to run the DWP, was talking about um, failure. And he was talking about how failure in the private sector is actually tolerated, in some ways even celebrated as part of the process of learning. Um, whereas with the public sector, you know, he talked about the shame of, of failing and how it really disincentivizes people to, to innovate. And, you know, um, so it's been, it's been interesting to, um, to be uh, working on a program that, you know, has pretty much become the current example of sort of um, government incompetence. But, uh, but I, I think that we're, it, we, we are innovating. Um, we're going to come through. We're going to fix the problems that we have. And, you know, a few years from now, I think we're going to look back and say, you know, we, you know, the environmental benefit of the program, we, can, we can't imagine that we used to do things a different way. So um, that's the big picture in LA. Um, we're, you know, throughout the state, we, want, we, we need to start dealing with food waste. Um, the fact that we're now having a system that is regulated is going to give us the platform in LA for dealing with food waste. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, we need more infrastructure um, and, you know, Wanting to talk about, you know, the energy nexus with with waste. Um, in the past, you know, the city's looked at doing um, a waste a waste to energy project. They do these in a lot of different places in the world. Where you, but now that we're actually looking at organic waste and food waste, there's a lot more energy there. And so, how do we think about that? Um, the other thing that you know we need to think about as a city, as a region, is the marketplaces for recyclable commodities. Um, you know, we've previously just sent things to China. Um, it's very cheap to do it because of the trade imbalance. And um, they're starting to close their doors, but you know, these commodities are actually, they're opportunities. Um, so if we can bring technology and innovation to bear, we're, we're gonna have a whole lot more recyclable commodities in LA. Um, what are we doing with these things? How can we use them? How can we put them back into our economy? Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, I wish we were doing a lot more on, you know, packaging, on, on reuse, on reduction. I think those are topics that um, are uh, hugely important so that these things don't even become waste. Um, so those are some of the things that are on my mind as we gear up to talk about Waste Management 2.0. And I will turn it over to Claire Fox for, for her thoughts on where we're at. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Penning. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? 
Yeah, hang in there. Good. All right. Um, well, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Claire Fox. I'm the executive director of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council. We are a nonprofit organization that was created by the city of LA under the previous mayoral administration under Vera Gosa. Actually, our founders in the room, Paula Daniels, who's also a former public works commissioner, interestingly enough. Um, and our mission is to make food healthy, affordable, sustainable, and fair for all Angelinos. So that's, that's a lot of values right there in one statement, and we, we really stick to that. We believe in cultivating um, a holistic food system that can serve everyone. We believe all communities deserve access to good food, and when we talk about good food, it's not just nutrition, nutritious food or healthy food. It's food that's grown in a way that respects the planet and respects people. So what does all that have to do with food waste? Good question. So we came into the conversation around food waste um, a couple different ways, but I would say the real motivator actually was through the urban agriculture community and people who are really motivated to grow food in cities, recognizing that the quality of our soil in cities is uh, toxic and you know potentially dangerous to grow food in and so there was a great deal of passion around composting um, around the time that this interest was emerging is when Recicla was really coming online and we realized that we have common cause with folks who want to see uh, a reduction in, uh, uh, in our reliance in landfills uh, we estimate that about a million tons of food and organic matter go to LA's landfills every year. It, once it's there and breaking down without oxygen, it's emitting methane into our atmosphere. So there's a real environmental reason for this, but there's also a real moral reason to not waste food, which is the paradox of hunger and food insecurity. LA County is home to the largest food insecure population in the country, 1.5 million residents are food insecure, meaning they're not getting adequate daily nutritional intake. Um, and that's, a, that's an economic reality. That means people are choosing to pay the bills or pay rent on time or you know uh, get a bus pass so they could go to work instead of eating food. So how is it that we're throwing a, a million tons of food away every year uh, when there are, our neighbors are hungry? So, so we sort of come into this conversation around, okay, so then what do we do about it? How do we prevent food? If food is still edible, it needs to be salvaged, rescued, recovered, and brought to places where it can be put to use and feed people, feed Angelinos. So there's a great deal of work happening around that, around food recovery, which is, you know, it, it could be anything from gleaning, from backyards, from farms, from farmers markets, from the produce terminal market, food that is maybe cosmetically imperfect or for a variety of other reasons is not gonna make it to market and making sure that it's going to hunger relief sites like shelters and food banks. Um, and then the other piece of it is when food is no longer edible, it's still a resource, right? All the water, all the energy, all the labor that went into the cultivation of that food is resource that can be recaptured. So in our community, in our network, we, we have what I call the food waste working group, but actually they are, they want to be called the food rescue and, um, how do they call themselves? Food rescue and recovery working group because we don't want to use the word waste anymore. We really think it's important to reframe the way that we think about food itself from farm to fork and beyond, that it's always a life resource. So that's where we get into sort of the world of composting and community composting. So through um, Recicla in particular, we've seen an opportunity to create a new sort of civic infrastructure um, and awareness around food recovery. In particular, uh, one shining light, I think, of Recicla, just to lift up something positive here about the program is that now um, businesses are off, b food businesses are given resources about how they can donate food. And this is really critical because there's a lot of misconception. Uh, there's a lot of fear of lawsuits. Uh, the Good Samaritan Act federal legislation protects industries, businesses from donating, uh, from lawsuit if they donate food in good faith and, and with best practices. So now what we're seeing is the waste haulers through Recicla and the city of Los Angeles partnering with food recovery organizations to create that sort of second layer of food recovery infrastructure to support caterers, 
banquet halls, restaurants who have leftover food that's still edible, that's still safe to eat, to be able to donate it to hunger relief sites. Um, another example I think of, of where we see this intersection of food waste and food insecurity and broader food policy issues is through an effort called LA County to, to trash your food or to, to throw it away. So those are some of the ways that we show up for this conversation. I look forward to digging into it more. Thank you, Claire. <coughs> Um, Paul, why don't you tell us what is going on out there in Paris? Yeah, I'm getting out, but I'll stay here. I think you, you could just put up that image, please. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, let me start by just asking how many here are local or LA based? Uh, okay, okay, good. Um, I represent a company uh, that has been in the waste industry for about 50 years, family owned, that grew with Orange County. It's now uh, one of the larger privately held waste companies in the US. We have about 1,500 employees and we operate about 1,000 heavy duty trucks. So it's, it's, it's got scale. Um, what I want to share with you is the path we took to looking down the road, far down the road, and said, how could we build a post-landfill technology? I used to regulate the waste industry, so I have some background. Uh, how do we do that? Um, and that question came up about 15 years ago. Began a long, arduous path to look for a system that might work, that might recycle particularly organic waste because we saw that as the, the area that had not been attended to. Um, after a long search, about five years ago, we began uh, construct, uh, five years we settled on anaerobic digestion uh, as our path, and our path was going to combine anaerobic digestion to produce renewable gas, to power our truck fleet, and to produce soil products from the process of anaerobic digestion. So what I'd like to do is um, highlight, here's an image uh, pretty much of what the facility looks like today. Uh, there are four tanks or those white um, tops. There are actually two of them built. There will be two more additionally. But other than that, it pretty much looks like that. It's a big facility on a 52-acre site in the other Paris, P-E-R-R-I-S, California, um, in Riverside County, which is the center of our fleet operations <coughs> down there. Um, let me go through some of the metrics of what this does, and uh, hopefully it'll engender a few questions. So it was built over a three-year period. Uh, we use a German artificial stomach called a digester, uh, manufactured by Isomann Corporation, which does the paint coatings for much of the German auto industry and for Tesla. So it's a fairly high-tech firm with a lot of knowledge of process controls, and we like that. We use uh, a New Zealand technology after the anaerobic digestion occurs, the gas is, the raw gas, we call it, is about 50% methane and 50% CO2. We strip out the CO2, and that leaves us with a fuel grade, truck fuel grade, uh, renewable gas, so we could power our trucks. We have been using that gas and been operating for about a year now. And we will just begin today or tomorrow injecting that gas into the natural gas grid using the SoCal gas infrastructure. So we had to build a mile and a quarter pipeline and go through some serious rigmarole to uh, do that. We're one of the first to inject in the pipeline. Our purpose in this whole, and then we use a California, Southern California based engineering firm for building the plant. They're 
they've built wastewater facilities. So that's kind of what we call ourselves a wastewater plant on steroids. Um, and then we use a local um, Orange County engineer architectural firm. So um, the team has now worked together about three and a half years very, very well. A, a wonderful partnership. So what are our products? What do we get out of this effort? Uh, we get renewable gas. Um, we take in about 400 tons per day of source separated green waste and food waste. Like how many of you have a green can for your organics? So imagine the green can and you toss in, you can toss in food waste now. So um, we in, can. In certain parts of the city. Yes, it's I don't know how, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So um, we bring that material to our facility where we built a one acre green sorting because what we think this is all about is quality control. So we've invested five million just in sorting, further sorting what's already supposed to be sorted green and food waste. From this input, we get about 6,000 diesel equivalent gallons a day. And that translates into enough fuel to operate about 150 heavy duty waste recycling trucks per day and about 280 tons per day of soil product. That soil product is co, or we call it digestate. The digestate is co-composted with green waste. In a few cases, we land apply it for cover crop, for uh, feed, for the dairy industry in the neighboring areas. So the dairy industry is only about 20 miles away from the facility. So imagine then all the waste is sorted, sourced, most of it Riverside County, comes to this facility, the fuel is utilized locally, and so is the soil product. So it addresses this uh, attempt, we're not shipping material 8,000 miles, say, to China and so forth. It's a closed system. Um, <clears throat> on a carbon intensity index, the facility, um, the, the fuel, the truck fuel combination is a carbon negative by about minus 32 using the state of California's carbon intensity index. So technically it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, and those numbers are from CARB. It reduces the engine reduction is about a 60% reduction in NOx. So that's the smog precursor and a very important mission. We spent about 55 million so far on the two phases of what we expect will be a little over a hundred million dollar facility at full build out. 20% of the cost is public, 80% private by, by our company off our balance sheet. Now, I think the most important facet I want to underpin is public acceptance of technology. Our team had to go out and market something this new to city councils who had never encountered any technology like this. Our first city that we won a contract with was Costa Mesa. Most of the cities that have agreed to um, uh, use our facility are um, inland empire cities, fairly conservative. We've had over a hundred votes by city councils, not one negative. Why? It's kind of, I call it the back to the future story. <laughs> People really like the idea of that banana peel <laughs> tossed and becoming the fuel that their trucks are running on. I have, I'm running out of time? Yes. I think okay. We're, can we're, you we're, we're, we want to make sure we get to the questions. Okay. Can you give me uh, two minutes? Can you, can you do it in 30 seconds? <laughs> 30 seconds. Well, okay. I'm just about there. So um, I think I'll just, uh, you've got the general idea. I think I'll stop there. I, but I, with I, one ad, 
we do have a program that ties into your type of program to intercept the food waste that would otherwise, it's edible, mm -hmm. and not go into this system. There. That is a, a very interesting project, um, Paul, and, and uh, obviously the city of LA, we're, we're working yes, with you guys to start right sending right. some of our and testing out using our green bin, which normally is just for yard waste for food as well. Mark, um, the reason I sort of interrupted is that I thought it was a really good segue yeah. to what you're trying to do, which is um, one of the big challenges with uh, getting to zero waste are those remnants after you've recycled, there's still a certain amount of uh, content there, and you're looking at turning that into, what I'm looking into at fuel. I'm operating a, a PC when I do is math, so that's what you're looking Do you for. need help from? I think I'm going to do this. So I'm down, down there, can they help? Yes. All righty. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Nightum. I'm uh, president and CEO of a company called Green Conversion Systems. Um, and we were, formed a, uh, we were formed about seven years ago. Uh, and um, along with another company, whose technology we're currently using called Accordant. And we're, we are in existence to basically address a basic, a, a basic problem the world has, which is it's producing a lot of waste. Um, if you look at projections to 2025, uh, for example, Asia is going to produce two and a half times more waste than it does now. Uh, the US is going to produce about 20% more waste than it does now. Waste keeps growing. At the same time, we've got to do something with that because of the greenhouse gases that have been mentioned already. Uh, but also in many geographies, you've got water pollution problems from it, and also many geographies are running out of space. So um, this, the development of this technology came out of the fact that we were, the parent company was a MRF operator, and we operated 21 MRFs. And we said, look, to get to zero waste, we've got to figure out what to do with the material that's left over after you take all the recyclables out, after you take the organics out, you still have 30 to 40 percent, sometimes 50 percent left, which was going to a landfill. So we worked for, we spent about 30 million dollars, uh, four years of effort, and we, um, and we, if I hit this right, no, help me on next page, there, thank you. And what we have done is developed a way to take what's left over after you take the recyclables out and turn that into a solid fuel. Basically the process, you, you, I'm sure everyone in the room is very familiar with the first part, waste is collected. Um, you, know, you take it to a MRF, you could take the organics out, you're gonna separate the recyclables out that you can, uh, and that's gonna get us to 40 to 50%, maybe sometimes 60. The material that's left, uh, the fibers or the plastics or the, the stuff that's too small uh, to really recover. In the past, a lot of that's sometimes been incinerated to, to get to a quote zero waste. Incineration doesn't work anymore, it's a bad idea, you have a smokestack. Uh, it's not capital efficient anymore because the price of natural gas. And so what we do is take the plastics and the fibers, um, we size separate, we uh, size them differently, we take the chlorine out, uh, and we'll make a solid fuel that we design to be a perfect coal substitute. With the exception that it has one third of the CO2 of coal, it has no sulfur, it has no nitrogen, but exactly the same BTU per pound. Uh, so that makes it a very green fuel. It, the US EPA deems it a 60% recyclable fuel because of the papers and fibers and other things that are in it. And it's very easy for people who are using solid fuels right now to just integrate into the system because of the way we have designed its physical characteristics. So we believe we've got a, you know, a very good solution to get to the theme of this session, which is you know, waste 2.0, what's the next step to help us get to zero waste? Um, and our first projects are, um, starting, are being developed here in the LA Basin. Uh, I learned that uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk at this conference about how California is leading the way, uh, and we see a lot of 
you know, benefit of rolling this out in the LA Basin and helping to get to zero waste goals. So I'll, I'll stop right there. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I think I will ask, um, I'll ask everyone the same question, and if you could keep your um, uh, uh, response um, brief, then we'll open it up um, to, to you guys for any questions you might have. Um, and I think what I, what I want to hear from, from you as, you know, as we're looking ahead in our effort to get to zero waste, um, you're all part of that. What, what are some of the policies um, that we should be working on uh, in order to, to get uh, to zero waste? I can start. Sure. Yes, some of the policies. Okay. So, well, hmm, I'm going to answer that in a, a couple different ways, I think. So, I was just thinking about what Paul was saying around, you know, when, he's, when he gets the green bin, the waste in the green bin, and it's blended. You have food waste in there, and you have organic matter, yard waste. It's really important if we're going to effectively capture waste and reclaim the resource that we do have clean streams um, and that p people on the user end know what's going on and, and what to put where. Uh, that's an ongoing journey, right, of, of mass education. That's not necessarily, that can't be legislated, right? There's no policy fix for changing global consciousness. Ugh, wouldn't that be wonderful? But uh, I do think that's really critical when we're talking about Waste 2.0, is that we are talking about uh, a, a new kind of mass mobilization of civic participation and awareness um, so that we're able to create these new, essentially, product streams, right, that can be upcycled into different products. And um, I think about one of my favorite examples over the year of a really out, outside the box uh, example of a food waste related business stream was this company out of Santa Barbara that was growing crickets for cricket protein, like cricket bars, which I guess are super popular among athletes and, you know, other people who want a lot of protein in their diet. And he was growing, producing, mass producing crickets on extremely clean food waste streams, right? So think like juice pulp. It's not contaminated with anything else. Now, what they're doing is like the future, I think, and so how will policy catch up with that? How can policy be nimble enough? I think what the city has done with Recycla is critical in terms of leveling the playing field and really creating a new set of standards in terms of environmental standards and labor standards, and we have to also hold space for that for that place of innovation, because especially when it comes to reclaiming resources and upcycling them into new products, it's going to be rapid evolution. New technologies are going to come online all of the time. So when I think about policy, I think about that, you know, where's the room for, for nimble innovation and also how are we doing mass education and engagement of the public. Um, and I just want to say really quickly, too, that cities can help foster this through um, encouraging communities themselves to innovate, which Commissioner Penning, I think, has done a great job um, leading on this effort in terms of the food, food waste grant challenge, the first time the city of LA ever did a food waste grant challenge, basically giving uh, micro grants, $7,000 to $15,000 grants, to neighborhood groups to engage other Angelinos in getting food out of, of landfills. A lot of incredible community compost projects, school gardens compost projects, um, education, workshop, food recovery. So that's the, the ground level and the ground swell that we need to be able to sustain really good policy. Thank you, Claire. Um, Paul, what are your thoughts on, on well, policy? Well, I'd like to start and echo the, the need for education. Um, California has begun a huge shift to get organics out of landfill. As far as I can tell, there's no education component. When we implemented AB 939, the recycling law, you had to prepare an education component as part of your plan. So we lack that. We need education. We need LA. We need a partnership between a company like us and the city of LA to um, uh, let the public know that they have a role to play. Don't throw oil in the green and so forth. Second, uh, we don't have enough capital uh, in the system to build many facilities like this. We uh, were able, fortunately, to get the cities to pay about two to 250 per household per month, which is the bedrock, that plus the long-term nature of our contracts gives us a fighting chance 
to build a project. Then the state had grants. Right now, governor's budget has showed having the budget for Cal Recycle, which would reduce the amount of grants precisely at the time when we need them. Um, they cut it in half, right? The Cal Recycle, the organic Yes, waste. that's proposed. It's so proposed. we now have to deal with that, try to reverse that. So public policy plays a very important role, the laws and regulations. I'll stop there. Okay. Um, and Mark, how's the weather in LA? Amazing. <laughs> He's from New York. Um, I, I, I moved yeah. five years ago. I called my wife and said, I'm staying. You know, we're going to come back. Happy to have you and your, and your innovation. Um, what do you think about public policy? I think the public policy uh, that you know, we have in California as it compared to other places is clearly ahead. Um, you know, in terms of you know, speaking about what we're trying to do, I, I really don't see anything from a public policy, public policy standpoint that that's an issue. I think you know, a comment I guess I would make, and I would put part of the onus on the policy makers and part of the onus on the new technology developers is to make sure that the policies keep up with techni technical innovation. Uh, for example, our technology is not well covered or well, um, you know, fits, doesn't fit really well within current California reg. But I think, you know, it, it's on both the new technology developers and the policy makers to talk to each other, right? We're a team, we're not competing. And to make sure that, you know, for example, if we have a technology that's going to get, help get California to 90, 95%, maybe 100% waste aversion, that we work together to make sure that the, the public policy and the other policies are, uh, you know, can help make that happen. Okay. Um, thank you all. Uh, we have a few minutes to, to hear from you, your burning questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, I'll, I, on the circular economy, it, it, um, I'm not sure that this completely answers your questions and, and maybe someone has a better answer. I've been thinking a lot about like Amazon. I mean, they're reading so much cardboard. How do we get these companies that are shipping all this stuff to take back their cardboard and use it again? Um, in terms of composting, you know, we don't, uh, right now we don't have um, community composting sites. They've done it in New York, um, and we're really trying to, to do that in LA. Uh, Claire mentioned the food waste um, challenge grants. We, we funded a project in, in each region of LA, so we are gonna have a, a project up and running in West LA. I can send you the info. Um, it'll be a pilot, which hopefully will keep going beyond um, the cycle of the grant. Any other thoughts? Well, yeah, I think to, it's probably not an exact answer, but there are many of the bigger corporations are pursuing um, I would say an aggressive recycling, whether it's Coca-Cola is doing it, Kimberly Clark's doing it, Amazon's doing it, uh, a number of the other big companies where they're, they are putting specifically focused recycling efforts in place for their products. So for example, uh, you know, Coca-Cola will pay a little bit extra, right, to get their own cans back and are then reprocessing a lot of that themselves. So it's, we're getting there. Um, but, um, you know, I still think there, obviously, there'll be some economic hurdles along the way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one more, que uh, two more questions, yes. Thank you. 
In general, um, the price of tipping at the landfill is way lower than it should be. Mm -hmm. But people, you know, um, may, I'm interested to see, Paul, if you have any thoughts on this, yes. but people, I mean, going through this right now with our recycling program, <clears throat> you know, to, peop to see their, their rates go up, I mean, the, people are resistant. It's like anything, it's like a gas tax. I mean, it's, it, it, it comes down to education, right? Because, you know, if, if I'm, you know, if I'm a resident, maybe I don't make a lot of money, right? And now suddenly my, I got to pay more to get rid of my trash. I mean, it's it, it's a tough political sell and gets back to education that we've been talking about up here. Yeah, the um, we were never able to get a landfill tax. I used to kind of lust for that. Because <laughs> that, that would be the quickest way to pay for a tremendous amount of infrastructure. But that requires a, a, some fairly uh, significant political courage to uh, bring that about. We haven't been able to do that. We can achieve maybe the functional equivalent of that through grants and through incentives like the use of renewable fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are multiple pulls, but no, we couldn't pull off the landfill tax which changed England's a whole system almost in a, just a few years. Worthy goal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, who, yes, sir. My question was for, excuse me, for Mark. Mark, what are the outlets for the product that you are creating? Is it yeah. like a, something similar equivalent to coal, but is it like primarily power plants or who are the outlets? The, the, the initial target for the fuel is uh, cement kilns because cement kiln, um, and, and this, this actually plays on the policy a little bit too, a little bit because. Um, there's certain uses or certain industries that cannot use anything but a solid fuel like coal. It's just the inherent nature of the industry. And so what our target is is to kick coal out of those industries. And, you know, we've already had good discussions with uh, Mitsubishi Coal here, uh, a number of other the coal producers who are eager to find a substitute that will dramatically cut back their CO2 emissions, which, which this will. Uh, which will cut their CO2 back by one third. Uh, so it's it's really that that is the target uh, for the the initial production. Yep. Okay, we have time for one more question. But before we do, I want to give a shout out to David Abel, the uh, the the creator of the Verde Exchange. Thank you, David, for all you do. Final question. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, Walker. Good question. Uh, we have a very uh, special process in California, in California alone. It's called Rule 30. Rule 30 says that, uh, I mentioned, when we use our current technology, we can strip out the CO2. And once stripped, that's good enough to run heavy duty gas trucks, gas engine trucks, with a substitute for fossil fuel. But California requires, if you go to the pipeline, you have to go to about 99%. That little difference costs us about $1.2 million. We had to import technology from Portugal to um, achieve that incremental uh, fuel value that would allow entry into the pipeline. Um, plus, we spent $7 million in total on the cleanup and pipeline. So that's a fairly exorbitant fee. Now, fortunately, or the line that's in now will serve all future phases. So we'll mm. gradually get back there. And the state does pay for up to three million of that cost under, a, under a, another legislative action. So we're asking 99% methane? Yes. Sure. Great. Thank you, guys.
Thank you. Um, 